Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, and welcome to our 269th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. Now, the way this call works is this is an AMA like you see on Reddit. You can ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, finance questions, career questions, personal development questions, etc. And my humble goal is to help you take your career or your business or your portfolio to the next level. Now, please keep typing your questions. I'll get to them in a second. Uh, and later on today, I'm going to provide you with 15 sales tips on how to sell anything, including yourself in an interview. And if we have time later on today, what I'll do is I'll tell you how to start a hedge fund. Okay, so let me kick it off with the financial controller. Great to see you. Thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. Dave wrote, hey, Chris, hope you had a great vacation. I did, thanks. I was in Florida uh, with my parents uh, and my son, uh, Dylan, played golf as well. I learned the best new golf tip, which is this, for any golfers out there. Hold your breath right before you swing. And the reason I say that is because in archery, if you hold your breath, you're more likely to hit the target. So if you hold your breath, you're more likely to not mess up because when you inhale and exhale, it actually moves your body a little bit. Okay, let me get to more questions here. David wrote, hey, Chris, uh, great to see you. You wrote, I see your Blue Jays are trying hard, but they can't figure out the Yankees yet. Uh, the season's still young. You guys beat us last night, that's for sure. But we won two out of three. Yeah, you guys are doing great. Uh, and then you wrote, um, I I'm thoroughly enjoying the course. Thank you. Still in the initial personal development courses uh, for the uh, MBA program uh, on lecture number eight. Um, I think I'm up to 12 recommendations so far. far. God bless you and great work. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Carolyn uh, from Canada wrote, good morning, Chris. Nice to have you back likewise. Uh, Lemon wrote, hi, uh, seems like I'm a day early for the open house. Yeah, so the open house actually starts uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. I just threw up a splash screen to, to, to advertise it. Sorry if that caused any confusion. Moving on to Laszlo who wrote, hey, Chris, uh, what are your expectations about a Fed and ECB uh, rate cut? It's much less likely now for obvious reasons, right? So inflation is starting to tick up. Uh, as a result, we might only see one and maybe zero Fed rate cuts this year. Same thing uh, in Europe with the ECB. Yeah, not sure yet uh, about England. Uh, they'll likely cut rates because things are a little bit more problematic there. However, this morning, housing starts uh, were released much worse than expected. So maybe that will influence the Federal Reserve uh, to cut rates once or twice this year. We don't know yet. Okay. Um, next up, Rahul. Thank you for that donation. I'll go directly to Project Magu, where we build schools uh, overseas. Uh, you wrote, um, day two of two, what is a two-day work routine for an investment banker? Yeah. So when you first start in investment banking, and I caution everybody in this call, and I say this with love my heart, please think twice before you go into investment banking. In fact, before you choose any career, before you figure out how to get that job, ask yourself why. Why do you want it? A lot of people want to be investment bankers because uh, they think they're going to make a ton of money. But the harsh reality is that you make the same amount of money as your buddies do, but you work a gazillion hours per week. You sacrifice your health, um, your social life, etc. Now, what entry-level investment bankers do is they work on pitch decks, like PowerPoint slides. And the managing director or vice president or associate they work for is usually trying to pitch M&A ideas uh, to big companies. For example, um, if Zoom stock were to get cut in half, then the managing director would call Microsoft and say, hey, I think you should buy Zoom. Uh, it's better than Microsoft Teams. Here's why. So you'd work on that pitch deck, the PowerPoint presentation. You'd also work on financial models as well. So you get to work at like, I don't know, 8 a.m. in the morning. You work on financial models all day. And in this example, you might work on uh, the merger model or acquisition model of Microsoft buying uh, Zoom. Um, and you'll work very, very late. You might work seven days a week uh, as well. Yeah. And if you want to get a job uh, as an investment banker or any industry, um, please don't just send in your resume. And the reason I say that is every time you see a job opening online, you literally have a one in 250 chance of getting that job. It's hard, man. The person that gets the job ultimately knows somebody at the company. So what you have to do is you have to network like crazy. And in my MBA degree program, I teach you how to network on steroids and how to set up the best LinkedIn profile and so much more. And so what you have to do is you identify the company you want to work at, let's say Goldman Sachs. And this is exactly what one of my platinum st students did a year and a half ago. 
he was halfway through my MBA program and he got a full-time job uh, at Goldman Sachs in investment banking in the same start class as Harvard MBA uh, graduates at the associate level. So what you have to do is you have to send out, once you identify the company you want to work at, like Goldman, for example, then I want you to do an advanced search in LinkedIn. And I want you to find people that work at Goldman or whatever firm you want to work at and find two things you have in common with them. And then you send them an in-mail. Okay, for example, John, hope all is well. I also went to the Toronto French School, which I did. And I'm also in XYZ group, whatever it is. Please let me know if you have time for a coffee or a Zoom call. And that's all you write. And you only send in mails. You do not send emails because everybody in this call has opened and read every single in mail you've ever received. And email is dead. It just doesn't work anymore. And they will take that meeting with you. And if you don't believe me, I want you to picture this. Imagine it's 20 years in the future and you're 20 years more successful than you already are today. And somebody reaches out to you that reminds you of yourself when you're 20 years younger. And they went to the same school as you. And maybe they're in the same club as you or live in the same neighborhood. And they reach out to you and they ask for a meeting. Would you take that meeting? Of course you would. Do this 20 times for each company you want to work at. During the meeting, what you want to do is always bond before business. And later on today, as I mentioned earlier, I'll share with you 15 sales tips on how to ace an inter interview. But you want to bond before business. And then about 10 minutes into that informational meeting, and by the way, this works with uh, trying to get customers as well. But about 10 minutes into that intro, uh, informational meeting, the person you're meeting will, will, will say something like this. And it won't be harsh like this, but they'll say, why are we meeting? They won't say it like that. And then at that point, you, you mentioned that you're, you're passionate about whatever industry it is you're interviewing for. Um, and you'd love some advice on how to position yourself. Then at the end of that meeting, after you bonded and after the meeting goes well and you profusely thank them, then immediately you want to ask them, are you hiring? And if they say no, then say, uh, when might you be hiring? And if they say, well, in three months, actually, then you, you contact them in three months. And if they still say no, then you ask them, do you know anybody else that also went to the Toronto French School or whatever you have in common with them that is hiring in this industry? Yeah. Again, do that 20 times, rinse, lather, repeat. It works, I promise you. It's like dating. Yeah. You only have to be right one time, right? Okay. All right. All right. Good to see you. Good time. Thank you for that, that comment. Uh, uh, Rahul wrote, how are you? I'm always great. Thanks. Always great. Really busy, but but loving life. Yeah. I'm doing what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, Lemon wrote, I just got started with your billion series uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, the amount of info you seem to pack in, into them uh, is insane. Thank you. I, I hope you thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, I publish uh, a vlog every week uh, on billions uh, and other movies as well that teach you about finance based on the movies. Now, I'll show you what I'm working on next. I'm doing the big short next, okay? Uh, and I'll explain exactly how, how all that stuff worked in that movie. Then I'm going to be doing Margin Call. And of course, I'm going to be doing every single episode from Billions. I'm currently on uh, Season 2, Episode 3. Uh, and so uh, my vlogs drop every Friday at 9 a.m. Tomorrow, uh, Season 2, Episode 3 drops. Thank you. Next up, Good Times wrote, uh, what are important valuation considerations when buying an online a digital business? Yeah. So it sounds like it's, it's, it's a private company. So what I would do is I would look at similar companies uh, in that market space, right? So what you want to do is look at smaller cap uh, online uh, marketing companies, for example, and see what earnings multiple they trade at, or more importantly, what revenue multiple and EBITDA multiple they trade at. Um, and then you want to make sure that the company you're looking to invest in has a similar growth profile. So you can value those companies at the same, uh, at the same valuation. I'll give you an example of three private companies um, I, I invested in and did the IPOs of back in 2012. So in the summer of 2012, uh, I invested in ServiceNow uh, as well as Workday and Splunk, which got acquired by Cisco last year. And when I looked at those companies when they were private, before they went public and I participated in the IPOs, the, rel the valuation for cloud-based software companies at that point in time was between 15 and 20 times revenue. And so that's how I valued those three companies. And they had similar growth profiles as well to other larger cloud companies. So that's what I would do. 
Now, in my MBA degree program, uh, if you're taking it, uh, if you go to EMS 4-2, that's Economics Management Strategy Semester 4 Class 2, there's a 100-step investment template I provide you with that will help you to crystallize your thought process when it comes to valuing the company. Don't forget to spend a lot of time looking at the management team, too. Yeah. Because ideas are commodities, but execution uh, is not. All right. All uh, right. Next up, uh, Good Times wrote, uh, also, Chris, my name is Frank. I'm, a, I'm excited to catch this live uh, on time. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Nice to meet you, Frank. Okay, Elijah wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Hey, is it possible to move uh, from working as a corporate finance analyst to working uh, at a hedge fund? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And if there's time later on today, maybe in the last half hour of this call, I'll teach you about um, how to network to get a job at a hedge fund and also uh, how to start a hedge fund. Now, what I recommend doing if you want to switch from corporate finance uh, to work at a hedge fund, what I recommend doing is, as I mentioned earlier today, you set up a lot of informational meetings um, because hedge funds don't advertise, right? Uh, and usually they don't post uh, openings online. So what you have to do is network like crazy. And when you go to the informational meetings, on the back of your resume, I want you to, this is just dummy data here, I want you to bring a one-page write-up. It's tough for you to see this here. But on this one page write up, it's about a stock, Apple, with a target price. I listed here fundamentals, valuation, and technical analysis. Put that in the back of your resume. When you meet with them, you give them that write up. And then follow up with them after the meeting. Uh, every week, send a different one page write up, longs and then shorts, and alternate. Make sure you pitch shorts as well because a lot of newer people that work at hedge funds or want to get hedge fund jobs uh, only pitch longs. And if you have additional questions, please let me know. And this template here, as well as 12 other templates for any type of job uh, I, I teach you and provide you with uh, in my MBA degree program. Sounds like a lot of work, but you have to ask yourself, how badly do you want that job? Yeah. All right. Uh, in terms of what to learn about finance uh, on a daily basis, if you're interested and you don't have time, what I do is exactly this. When I wake up and I'm showering, getting ready, I do this. Alexa, what's the Wall Street Journal news? From Press Association Alexa, on March 23rd, Alexa, 2020. Stop. Sorry. So you say, Alexa, what is today's Wall Street Journal news? And Alexa will, will give you the, the briefing in five minutes. You're good to go. All right. Uh, next up, Jason wrote, uh, hello, all. Uh, yes, they will take the meeting. It's true. It's true. Th these, these work. These, these networking principles work. And if you want to learn more about uh, networking, uh, and I've humbly raised and managed uh, over a um, over billion dollars uh, in, in my career, and I made every mistake there is to make. What you can do is go to my website, uh, harunmba.com, scroll to the bottom, and you can download my, my networking book for free. It's a couple hundred pages plus several hours of YouTube videos. Okay. And I just got a brand new Mac. I had to run out yesterday and get it because my Mac Pro stopped working. So I had to get one of these things. It's working well so far. Yeah. Okay. Um, next up, Chris Cross. Hey. Wrote, hey, Chris, if I can't buy ticker GLD, you're talking about uh, the, the gold uh, ETF. This is fake. Yeah. Uh, then you're, you wrote here, uh, what alternative tickers are there to buy gold? Yeah. Yeah. So th the best resource I can always provide you with uh, when it comes to ETFs is ETFDB.com. And I don't recommend investing in mutual funds because they're a scam. I, I recommend investing in ETFs after you do your research. Let me show you. Okay. So what you do is you go here to ETF database, ETFDB.com, okay? And then what you can do here is you can look at uh, commodities or gold right here. And then you can find uh, right here. So GLD, you said you can't buy. Uh, maybe you can buy this one here. And what you gotta do is look at liquidity, obviously, see if it trades a lot because illiquid stocks own us in a down market and the expense ratio. And this expense ratio actually is lower than, than GLD. Yeah, so. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Lemon wrote, uh, do you have any insights on how someone from outside the United States can get into investment banking coming from a technology consulting uh, market? Yeah. Uh, the doors seem to be closed. Yeah, it's so funny because I, I was just like you. I worked in Canada at Accenture. I was a technology consultant in the 90s. And I wanted to work at Morgan Stanley in New York. And so I called them. I said, can I send my resume? They're like, sure, it's tough to get a job here. You know, Best of luck. They didn't say that. Uh, but what I would do is this. Um, I would I would network with people in the country you want to move to that work at that firm. You never know. You never know. Now, 
side note here for anybody that lives in a certain country and you want to move to another country, here's how you do it. And let's say, and I'm going to give you an example. Uh, let's say you live um, in France and you want to uh, live in the United States, in New York City. What I recommend doing is, is this. Join an American company in France. Work extraordinarily hard for five or 10 years. It takes a while. And you'll get promoted a couple of times. And then eventually you'll get to VP level or whatever it is, a senior level. And what they'll probably do, as they do in most big companies, is they'll ask you if you can relocate to the mothership headquarters. Um, that's how you do it. it. It's more of a long-term strategy, but it works exceptionally well. Uh, that's actually how I did it, how I moved from Canada to the United States when I worked at Goldman Sachs, yeah. All right, but you gotta be long-term focused. All right, uh, Jason wrote, uh, using the informational meetings paid off for my platinum MBA uh, with Chris three times over. Thank you, God bless you, I appreciate that, yeah. Uh, next up, uh, Armin wrote, uh, hey Chris, uh, what is your recommendation for pivoting to management consulting from construction slash engineering? Uh, is getting an MBA a must? Yeah, so my thought process on getting an MBA at a traditional school is this. I want you to set up 100 informational meetings. And if you still can't change careers after 100 informational meetings, then consider getting an MBA at a traditional school. Now, if you do get an MBA at a traditional school, keep in mind that it costs, and you know I love to teach with props, it costs you literally $100,000. Take my, cost you $100,000. Um, also, uh, you're, it, it's, it's hard in your social life too because you, you, know, you, you end up moving to a different city for about two years. So set up those 100 informational meetings if you still can't change careers and consider getting an MBA at a traditional school. Now, I want you to pretend that each one of those 100 informational meetings costs you $1,000. 100 times 1,000 is 100,000, right? And, so, and they're free to do as well. Um, so I would network like crazy because your network is your net worth. All right, uh, uh, next up, uh, and I'm so sorry, I know you're going with this. Uh, Yash wrote, uh, said here, my A-L-E-X-A just went off, uh, spouting Wall Street Journal, listening to your video, Chris. Uh, A-L-E-X-A loves you, uh, thank you. Uh, and then you wrote, uh, on a serious note, I love the journal advice though, gonna follow it uh, from tomorrow. It, it's fantastic, yeah. And it helps you work smarter uh, and not harder. Now, years ago, I remember I was at a conference when I worked uh, in venture capital. Uh, and it was actually a hedge fund conference. And I was up on the stage and there were some very abrasive hedge, I gotta be careful what I say, hedge fund analysts from New York that were pestering the panel that I was on with questions. And so I said this, S-I-R-I, -I, set an alarm that repeats every day at 3 a.m. And back then, uh, S-I-R-I -I, uh, recognized everyone's voice. And so everyone in the audience was like, damn it. Yeah. Hi, I'm seven and a half. Okay. Uh, next up, Rahul wrote, um, "What do you? What's your say on Mac versus uh, Windows Is it on on the context of performance gaming editing?" Yeah. So for gaming, you can't get a Mac, right? Macs have great graphics cards, uh, but the games suck. Yeah, they're not nearly as good. If you want to be a gamer, you get uh, get a Windows PC. And uh, quick side note here for everybody in this call on a serious note: next year, for at least a month, maybe six weeks, I'm not going to be doing this weekly webcast. Because when GTA 6 comes out, I'm going to be playing day and night. I can't wait. Yeah. Now, when it comes to um, other stuff, uh, like video editing, definitely a Mac. I like it a lot better. I edit all my videos, all my billions of videos, everything myself. Um, and, and I use Final Cut. I love it. Uh, you can use Premiere Pro on a Mac or Windows. It's harder to use, though. Yeah. Uh, in terms of performance, I like Macs much better uh, because they don't crash as much. Right. So and, and we all know what it's like when you buy a, a great new Windows laptop. It runs fast and after a while it slows down a lot. Yeah. Because it downloads and stuff. All right. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Matteo. Hey, Matteo. My son's name is Matthew. Uh, Matteo wrote, um, I'm 25 years old uh, from Italy. Uh, great to meet you. I've been following you since 2020. We never had the chance to interact because I couldn't make the live streams. I owe you. I'm grateful for your work. Thank you so much. God bless you. I, I have three boys, um, Andrew, Matthew, uh, and Dylan. And they're older now, but Matthew just got into a McGill University Commerce program where, where I went as well. I don't know if he'll go. I don't think he will. It's too cold. 
All right. Um, bah, 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 bah. Uh, next up, Ted. Hey, Ted. It's been a while. Uh, good to see you. You're hey, Chris. Why can't a nose be 12 inches long? Because then it would be a foot. I like that. I like that. It, oh, it can be 12 inches long, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next question, follow up from uh, Frank. Uh, when he, he asked about a, a private marketing, a digital marketing company he wanted to buy. Uh, he wrote here, what about valuation considerations when buying a small business like a car wash uh, or a laundromat? Yeah. Um, so you want to make sure they throw off a lot of cash, uh, obviously. Uh, and the three most important things in real estate and with retail outlets like this are location, location, location. Make sure it's in a superb location. Now, I have a real estate elective coming out that's exclusive to my MBA degree program. Everybody that signs up for my MBA or has signed up or will sign up uh, will get the real estate elective uh, for free. It comes out this fall. Uh, I teach you about how to buy investment properties and so much more. I just put a bid on another house uh, in Florida. Um, I took a video of it last week as well when I was down there. I'm going to put that in the elective. Uh, so location, location, location is important. Yeah. And in the MBA degree program, um, I also have a template uh, to analyze uh, and value private companies. Yeah. Now, never invest in anything if you don't get an investment offering memorandum. Okay. Um, and so before you invest uh, in publicly traded companies, you can read S1s, of course. And this is the S1 from Facebook when it went public uh, back in 2012. And if you can't get an investment offering memorandum from a private company or a public company, don't invest. Okay. Hey, Charles. Manas, how are you from India? Great, great to see you. you wrote, Good morning, my, my dear mentor, Chris, please. Hope all is well. Uh, long time. Uh, last time uh, we met 100 mil million years ago. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a while. Yeah. And my mom always told me, Chris, I told you 8 million times not to exaggerate. Um, uh, and then you wrote here, how's everything going there? Things are great. Things are always good. Thanks. Uh, and in about two weeks, um, McGraw-Hill is publishing uh, my finance essentials uh, book as well. I'm really excited about that. So I'm working hard as always, but I love doing what I'm doing. All right, moving on to Zaid who wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, let's say uh, I'm uh, doing a job. I'm doing a job. Sorry. I am very immature. That's okay. Uh, you wrote, uh, let's say I'm doing a job and have a, a lot of useful and rare knowledge, which I want to sell through a course. Can you show a roadmap on how to do it part-time and make a good earnings uh, with it? Yeah, anybody can teach online. Uh, what I recommend doing is um, you can always ask me for tips. I'll tell you exactly how to create an amazing, link, or amazing uh, online course because I've made every mistake there is to make. You want to make sure there's a portable skill set you impart with your, your viewers, your students uh, within the first five or ten minutes of the course. I have many other tips as well. Put your course on Udemy. And what you can also do is put the course on teachable.com for free. So you can go to teachable.com, put your courses up there for free as well, and it will look like it lives on your website. And for me and my company, when you go to harunmba.com and you watch my courses, they're all stored on teachable.com. And teachable.com, I'm not affiliated with them, um, meaning uh, I don't take any endorsements from anybody on the planet, uh, but it's free to use. Yeah. Now, the loneliest place in the world is page two of Google search rankings. So it's really hard to get publicity for your courses. And so what I recommend doing is this, regardless of if you want to publish a course or not. I, I want you to all think about repurposing content and creating content and repurposing into a book. And the best analogy I can use is Nintendo, which is the oldest tech company in history. So Nintendo, what they do is they repurpose their older 8-bit, 16-bit, 64-bit, Switch, etc., games on a future future consoles. I want you to do the same thing. So what I want you to do is I want you to write one article every single week and post it to LinkedIn. Okay, and then after two years of doing that, you'll have over a hundred articles. Then you can repurpose all that stuff, all the articles you wrote, into a book. And I can give you this template right now if you want me to. Just go to harunmba.com/slash/write-book, all lowercase. And the articles you put first, I mean the first chapters, are the ones that got the most views, clicks, likes, etc. Uh, on LinkedIn. Then what you do is all the articles that you wrote, you turn them into videos, you repurpose, kind of like the Mario thing. You repurpose them uh, into videos, TikToks, if TikToks around a couple of weeks, I don't know, uh, as well as Instagram, uh, etc. So the name of the game is repurposing content. 
and that way you work smarter, not harder. So for example, uh, with this weekly call that, that you're all watching, um, what I do is uh, I have my team um, create seven vlogs for the next week based on the seven best questions asked. So there's nothing left on this weekly call carcass, so to speak, by the time we're done with it. You got to repurpose all your content. Uh, now, in terms of driving sales uh, to your courses or to your website, there has to be a CTA, a call to action. And so for me, um, it's my networking book, um, as well as this book, etc. Yeah, you give something away, you ask for, for email addresses, all that stuff. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, you got to be long-term focused, all this stuff though, because once you start creating content on YouTube or anywhere else, um, at first, it's going to feel like you're screaming into the wind. You're not getting that many views, uh, etc. But uh, I want you to be a pit bull on the pork chop and, and stay in the game longer term because your competition will give up uh, after just a couple of posts. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, next, next up, uh, Manas wrote, Dubai is getting flooded with bad news from the Middle East. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's... Um, it's worrisome what's happened over the past week, and everybody reads the same headlines uh, as I do. Uh, I always pray every every night for peace. Yeah. Um, uh, ne next up, uh, Derji wrote, uh, "Hey Chris, uh, loved your Rwanda school inauguration. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm inspired to do the same thing in Ethiopia. Awesome. Very cool. If you want, reach out to me. Um, send me an email." And we'll set up a Zoom call if you want. So email me at support at haroonventures.com because my goal is to build a thousand schools uh, in Africa in, in my lifetime. We're currently working uh, on our next school. We secured 10 acres of land, uh, about a six hour drive from the Nairobi airport. Yeah. All right. Um, next up, uh, Manas wrote, iPhone sales slumped by 10% year over year. Demand is falling. Apple scraped uh, the EV car project. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't mind that they're not doing a car. Uh, if you're a shareholder in Apple, you don't want them to make a car because it would destroy margins. Yeah, and execution is a massive risk uh, as well. Yeah, I'd rather them focus on just software for cars. Uh, in terms of iPhone sales, I'm not surprised. I mean, this, this here is the iPhone 14. Um, 15 is not that much different. Um, and, and in fact, you could even use a model from a couple of years ago and it's good enough. Yeah, it's hard to tell the difference now. Yeah, uh, they, they really need to come out with a killer new product, uh, the Apple Vision Pro. Um, hasn't really worked out yet, I don't think. Yeah, there's no killer app for it yet. Okay. All right, uh, next up, uh, Mateo wrote, uh, it's a nice name, isn't it? It is. Mateo, Matthew, it's great. It's, it's Hebrew for gift from God, I think, too. Uh, you wrote, uh, I'm going through your Udemy course, and then I'll roll it in your MBA program. Thank you. Uh, I do it because I love the process of investing, and you make it uh, even more fun. Thank you. Thank you. I use just a ton of props and I always create new props to, to use in my MBA degree program when I explain how a balance sheet works. Uh, this is Bond and that's Boba Fett. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, next up here, uh, uh, Zaid wrote, uh, Chris, another question. Of course. Uh, I see a lot of private jets uh, with a work worth like $10 million, $30 million, sometimes upwards of $100 million. Uh, they land at airport nearby. Can you tell me the economics uh, of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's a write-off for big companies, right? And, and and high net worth investors. And a lot of people don't own those things. They lease them or it's like a timeshare, so to speak, with executive jets. Um, but the way it works is very wealthy people stay wealthy and get wealthy by trying to minimize the amount of taxes they pay, right? It's not fair, but uh, the 400 richest families in the United States pay just over 20% tax. It's not fair. It, it is what it is. Uh, and when you run your own business, you can write everything off, right? So for example, uh, this Mac Studio, it, it costs me 50% less because I, I can write it off, so to speak, right? From, from the taxes that I'll pay. Um, it, and also there's this crazy rule in California where if you own a very, very large car, like a, a big, big car, like one of those big uh, Mercedes tanks, it looks like those old Jeeps, um, you can write off close to 100% of that, yeah. Um, now, the, the reason why a, a lot of wealthy people pay less in taxes percent-wise, and again, it's not fair, uh, is because you have to have a taxable event. And I'll give you an example. Back in 2007, when Jeff Bezos was already a billionaire many, many times over, not only did he not pay any taxes, 
but he got $4,000 back for each of his four kits on his tax return. He got 16 grand back. And the reason was because he didn't sell any Amazon stock. And even Warren Buffett pays less in tax percent wise than his assistant does. He's said publicly that's the case and it's not fair. It is what it is. Yeah. And once you acquire a lot of capital, what people usually do is they hire tax lawyers. Yeah. Uh, and I've hired them. They cost a fortune, but they can save you a lot of money uh, as well. Yeah. All right. You're most welcome, uh, Frank. Uh, okay. Next up, Manas wrote, uh, Indian students are being, um, uh, are passing away in the United States left and right. Wow. It, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't know about that. It's not safe anymore to study there. Why is there discrimination uh, with Indian Asian students? Uh, it makes me sick. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm not, not aware of that. That makes, makes me sick as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then uh, uh, Lemon wrote, uh, hey, Chris, you mentioned informational meetings a number of times. Can you go into some detail on any tips you have to set them up and get the most uh, out of them? Yeah. So later on today, what I'll do is I'm going to provide you with 15 sales tips on how to sell yourself in an informational interview or any interview, uh, and that will definitely answer all those questions. Yeah. Um, uh, next up, uh, Frank wrote, uh, Chris, you mentioned your courses are on Udemy and Teachable. Are the courses courses uploaded separately or linked from one platform to, to the other. No, they're, they're completely separate. Yeah. Uh, next up, Roy wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, you once said cloud computing was deflationary in nature. That's right. In a speech I gave in 2016 in my, my TEDx talk. Um, do you think Gen I and the release of open source models becomes deflationary? Absolutely. Anything that drives the prices down for labor uh, in general um, is, is deflationary in, in nature. Yeah. And I'm really bullish on the S&P 500. I think over the next couple of decades, the average return on the S&P 500 is going to be 15%. That's on average. And the best way I invest in the S&P 500 when I'm not sure where to put my capital is I buy ticker VU, V-O-O. That's an ETF uh, made by Vanguard that represents the S&P 500 with low fees. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, why do people... Uh, crazy rich people buy jets because of carbon footprint and then they preach climate change. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I read between the lines. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, definitely with you there. Yeah. Um, what what look, some people do is they buy uh, carbon credits to offset the amount of carbon that they're putting into the atmosphere. And there's a number of companies uh, that are net carbon negative now, meaning that they don't pollute the opposite of that because of carbon credits uh, and they have solar on the roof like Microsoft, uh, Google, Facebook, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. And Derji wrote, uh, hey, Chris, I'm on the verge of finishing a Python course uh, that I made with, with Luca. Thank you. Uh, I'm planning a home-based tax business while pursuing my MBA. Uh, any startup advice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say always write a business plan. Most people don't do it. And failing to plan is planning to fail. And in my MBA degree program, um, I, there's a, a, a uh, there's a 15 hour venture capital boot camp in the third semester where I teach you how to write a business plan. And I, in fact, I ask you seven or eight hundred questions that you document into a template I create for you that will help you decide whether to go or no go with a startup. Yeah. Always write a thorough business plan first. Yeah. Okay. Um, and register the company too. You want to protect yourself and your family. Uh, and then Zaid said, I'd, I'd love to pay taxes by buying a jet. Uh, I'd be working hard to get as that wealth level. Thanks, Chris. You're, you're most welcome. I surely am not at that wealth level. I don't own a jet. I, I never will. Uh, quick side note for everybody in this call. Please do not do your own taxes. Always hire an accountant. You will get more money back and it'll keep you within the bounds of the law. If you run a company like I do, uh, get the same account to do your personal and professional taxes. Yeah. And doing your own personal taxes is like doing surgery on yourself. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And the reason the CPA or accounting profession exists is because governments change tax rules all the time. And it's impossible for us to keep up to date on it. And using, you know, software from companies like Intuit doesn't cut it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve, um, which is the, the manager of the store of money in America, uh, is worried about inflation rates hiking, uh, might not come soon enough. Is the market always priced in for cuts? Uh, so it rose like 9% in the first quarter. Yeah, yeah. 
I still believe we've we've had a soft uh, landing. Um, it's it's the role of the government to always make sure that inflation doesn't occur because inflation, like rampant inflation, like five to ten percent or more, it destroys an economy. So what they do is they they, they flood the market. I can never get this gun to work. They flood the market with with money in order to cut interest rates and vice versa through buying bonds in in the open market. Yeah, I'm not too worried. I'm more of an, I'm an optimist. Um, again, this morning we had a pretty lousy home sales. You know, one data point doesn't make a trend. Uh, but when you look at the entire mosaic from a high level perspective, maybe things aren't as rosy as we once had thought. But I don't really care because I'm very, very long term focused. Yeah. And you can't be short term focused. You can't be a day trader. And I say with love my heart. And we can't name any successful day traders over time because they don't exist. So always be long term focused when you invest. Yeah. Let me just turn this off. Every phone call I get, and it comes through on my iPad now, it's it says scammer. Yeah. All right. All right, next up. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Pranav wrote, uh, hey, Chris, I I'm moving to Paris soon uh, for my studies. Congratulations. Uh, I'm concerned about language barrier and internships. Um, how did you tackle upskilling and anxiety uh, while going to a different country? Yeah, so when I'm in France with my, my family, my American family, what I do is I, I, I speak slowly and in English and very loud. And, and they love it. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. So what I would do to, to learn another language, is it's tough. Um, uh, what I recommend doing is watch movies on television uh, in a different language or your favorite movies uh, with French subtitles. Yeah. And, and practice a lot. Yeah. And I spoke uh, French before English uh, in school. I didn't speak English in school to the fourth grade. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Manastro, uh, my mentor, Chris, please. Where is China as an economy going in the next 20 years? There's deflation there. The index is down like crazy. Uh, what is the future? Yeah, there's a lot of structural problems with China. And you wrote also communism, of course. Yeah, um, I know that tariffs are going up materially on, on, on steel that's exported from China. The problem with, with China right now is that there's, there's such a massive real estate bubble that's bursting. They're in a massive recession, borderline depression in the real estate and building market to the extent that they have a lot of excess steel that they're trying to export uh, to the United States. Now, the Trump administration threw on taxes uh, or uh, tariffs, I should say, uh, on steel. It looks like the Biden administration is going to up that uh, it, as well. Yeah. Longer term, it, it's tough. It's tough. Y you know, I'm not a fan of communism. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a capitalist at heart, of course. I believe in democracy and freedom of the individual. Um, and a lot of my students will say, I'm really worried, Chris, about the, the debt level in the United States. Um, and, and what I say to that is, yeah, we have to be fiscally conservative, but I wouldn't worry about that longer term because every investment you make is relative. Okay, so um, the very last company on the planet, so to speak, to go bankrupt would be the U.S. government. Right. Democracy works. Yeah. And that's why I'm bullish also in the S&P 500 longer term. Also because of artificial intelligence, I think profit margins are going to go through the roof uh, on a lot of big uh, uh, companies. Yeah. Uh, and I think hiring will slow a bit as well. Okay. Um, now, it, it's so interesting, uh, the impact of, of AI. Um, so Tyler Perry, who makes great movies, um, he, he was just about to build a $1 billion uh, 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 facility in Atlanta, a studio, movie studio. And the second that Sora came out, which is offered by uh, OpenAI, he scrapped those plans, right? So AI is disrupting every single industry. I'm excited about it. I'm certainly embracing it as well. Uh, to uh, streamline my, my processes and keep my, my costs very low. Yeah. Okay. If you want to know how, I'm happy to go there as well. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and then Jamo, hey Jamo, I wrote, taxes are on income, not wealth. Uh, that is why most people don't pay much in taxes. Uh, also, depending on the type of income, whether it's earned passive or portfolio income. Yeah, that, that's correct. Yeah. Um, now, I think that the tax code should change to the extent that if you're a billionaire, um, you should get taxed higher, right? Maybe it's an annual tax of 5% that's levied on, on billionaires. I, yeah, it's just not fair that, that billionaires don't have taxable events uh, and, and pay nothing in taxes. Yeah. But I am a capitalist. Yeah. 
Um, uh, and then Manas wrote, uh, are you going to open an AI company that will, uh, that, that will it be about what problem will it solve? Yeah. Um, so I am embracing AI uh, in, in what I do right now to help my revenue growth as well as to cut expenses. Yeah. In terms of opening AI company itself, no. But I think that in the future, in 10 or 20 years, every company will sort of be an AI company. Uh, next up, uh, SS wrote, I subscribed to your course in Udemy, uh, but in the spreadsheet, I was unable to choose a stock for my country from India. Please reply. Yeah, no, it should work. Um, I've architected that spreadsheet, all my spreadsheets, so they can you can import any ticker from any country. You might want to start with, uh, with, uh, with ADRs initially, but it should work. Now, please ask the question uh, within the course and we'll answer it right away and we'll help you. And if you still can't do it after that, then of course you get 100% money back guarantee, but it will work. Yeah. I've invested a lot in India over the years. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Zaid wrote, Chris, do you think if a war struck between uh, Israel and Iran uh, over the Persian Gulf, uh, will it lead to a recession? Um, uh, fall yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but, but yeah, it, it would be, it would be terrible for, for the global economy and the loss of life would be awful. Yeah. I, I don't think it will happen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm happy that the Biden administration has kind of been implying and outright saying we don't want this to escalate. Yeah. Uh, and as critical as I am on, on Biden's uh, economic policies, I'm not telling you if I'm a Republican or a Democrat, but as critical as I've been, I think he did a great job handling exactly what occurred uh, in the Middle East over the past week and a half. And Iran doesn't want war. Like, nobody wants a war, right? And, and I think what they did was kind of symbolic, yeah, that in terms of retaliation for what happened in, in Syria with, 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 with Israel. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to go there, though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Manas wrote, my mentor, you said something on taxes. You're right. But what if a tax GPT is made and it can fix itself to any country tax code? Well, that makes sense to you. I mean, nothing surprises me about, about AI anymore. Yeah, it's, it's scary how advanced AI is becoming. And I really do believe that every single company needs to have a chief AI executive officer and every single country needs to have uh, AI ethics uh, uh, government officials as well. We have to keep AI in check because as Warren Buffett said, once you open uh, AI's Pandora's box, there's no going back. It's frightening, actually, how quickly things are, are changing. Yeah. I'm a big fan of, of Elon Musk's outlook on that as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Mateo wrote, I, I won't be able to make it to the MBA live classes at this time. Um, no problem. Uh, will the silver program be enough for personal wealth management or will I miss on some key aspects? No, silver is good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's similar content in all of them. Uh, the golden platinum is just it's live and i also do a lot of one-on-ones and i have a new a diamond product as well which i can talk about if you guys want me to yeah yeah silver is kind of like netflix yeah okay uh and then mateo wrote for the guy asking on how to learn a language like french study vocabulary and do a, a lot of comprehensive immersion as chris said watch movies etc but you need the vocab to understand a, a bit of, of what they say yeah it takes practice, yeah. And as, as Tony Robbins said, uh, repetition is the mother of all skill. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Arrow X Superflight wrote, hey, Chris, uh, right before the rate hikes, uh, I started a solo firm as a CRE finance broker uh, and failed as a result. Is it worth revisiting getting an MBA uh, or go to the fund management route? I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I hear you. You're, you're exactly like me as well. You're interested in finance, but you're an entrepreneur at, at heart. Um, I, I would think about what your long-term goals are. Um, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start your own hedge fund or asset management firm longer term, uh, then working for a fund management uh, firm like a, a mutual fund, hedge fund, private equity firm would help you so that you can get a portable track record so you can raise capital longer term. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of going back to school for, for an MBA, as I mentioned earlier, what I would do is set up a gazillion informational meetings. If you still can't make that career change, then consider it. Yeah. Okay, next up, Frank wrote, uh, my wife is a party planner by hobby, cool. 
Uh, she now wants to be a legal business. I said, Chris says, make sure you have a business plan and pitch deck like Airbnb. She's working with a SCORE mentor right now. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got to write a full full business plan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the pitch deck, for those you're not familiar with, with the Airbnb pitch deck. So uh, Airbnb, which is a, a white common air uh, company, YC uh, company, uh, the company that Sam Altman used to run. One of the reasons they raise a lot of capital is because of their slide deck and their business model too, of course. Uh, but their slide deck is simplistic. It's the gold standard. It's about 12 slides and there's only three bullet points per page and sometimes just three images per page. Less is more. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, uh, the elections are due in your country in November. Uh, maybe it's going to be one of the, the most craziest months in the year. Are you worried? And by the way, uh, Steve... Uh, Swagerman has bought $400 million worth of, of put options. I, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Um, I, I'm more of an optimist uh, in general. Uh, there, there's a lot at stake, obviously. Um, but I, I can't believe that these are the best two politicians to run in this country. Like I, I, I'm just in shock. And like everything in life, it, it, it's all relative. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm probably more of a libertarian. But I go back and forth between a Republican and a Democrat based on who the candidate is. I'm just very confused at this point. Okay. Uh, and then Manos wrote, what do you think this person, Steve, is thinking by buying a $450 million worth of, of put options? Well, obviously, he, whoever this person is, expects a, a massive crash uh, in the markets. Yeah. Uh, and if anybody on this call wants to transact in options, please don't underwrite options, meaning don't sell them uh, or short them because your losses can be infinite. Yeah. And you can get randomly assigned. And I can go there if you want me to. If you want to buy options, uh, just buy puts and calls because the most you can lose is what you pay for the put or the call. Yeah. But be a long-term investor always. Renvir, how are you? Uh, Renvir from Mauritius wrote, how are you doing? I'm always great. Thanks. Uh, Real Living wrote, uh, what is the incentive to try to become successful? Uh, yeah, I, I would say this uh, in general. If you chase money, you lose your money and your dreams. But if you chase your dreams and you're willing to fail a bunch of times and you really don't care what people think of you, then something beautiful happens. Your dreams come true and the money follows accidentally. It always does. And all the best entrepreneurs think that way as well. And, and they've failed so many times. So you look at Gary Vaynerchuk and people are like, oh my God, he's an overnight success. No, he's a 45 year overnight success. Yeah, it takes time. And anybody that's ever managed anything has failed more times than all of us combined. Yeah, failure is a beautiful thing. Embrace it. It's not shameful. You only have to be right in business one time. Okay, uh, Nikuli wrote, uh, hey Chris, Nikuli from South Africa, nice to meet you. Uh, Elon Musk is about to have a big payday uh, should the shareholders vote uh, for his paycheck? Will he be paying taxes on his gains? Uh, is there a way for him to minimize taxes? Yeah, he has a lot of outstanding debts uh, given the, the purchase of Twitter. He did take on a, a lot of debt. Yeah, he's worth a fortune on paper, uh, but liquidity can sometimes be an issue. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, his tax mandate, I, I don't know, but, but I'm sure he has a ton of tax lawyers minimizing his tax burden. Yeah, uh, in terms of general compensation, um, I think he deserves it. I do. Um, he's worked extraordinarily hard. He's done more for uh, global warming, uh, to, to combat global warming than anybody in the history of this planet. Uh, and I think he's got noble intentions too when it comes to AI. Yeah, in space as well. Yeah. Yeah, he's controversial, but I think people are a little bit too critical of him at times. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Renvir from Mauritius wrote, uh, since recessions tend to lag a bit, do you think it could finally happen? Um, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. And there's a famous quote, which is, uh, economists have successfully predicted 12 of the past 86 recessions. Yeah. Yeah. But just be long-term focused. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And, and that way you can stomach the volatility. When you invest in a company and you come up with a target price of much higher, you know, years from now, you tell yourself, I don't know the path, but I know the destination. And you always got to be long-term focused. It works. I promise you. Yeah. Otherwise, what happens is, and this is frightening, this, this, this quote I'm going to give you. But Warren Buffett said that the New York Stock Exchange is the only store in the world where consumers sell stuff and it goes on sale. Think about that. 
you have to be long-term focused. And speaking of Mr. Buffett, who's invested in Coca-Cola since the late eighties, you know, if, if you invest in Coca-Cola day one, when it went public, you were down 50% one year later. But if you held on, obviously you, you make a killing. We have to be long-term focused. And in my MBA program, I think I, I teach you how to use a lot of different financial modeling uh, 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 templates, et cetera, to value any company and be long-term focused. The longer the view, the wiser the intention. Okay. Okay. Um, and IBR wrote, uh, love the course. Thank you. Okay, Hassan, hey, good to see you. You're, hey, Chris, hope you're well, likewise. Always nice to hear your advice regarding business. Your YouTube channel is my go-to reference uh, for bit size tips. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I just passed uh, 5 million views. Pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, Rahul wrote, uh, the Indian stock ticker works on Excel, but I have issues uh, with an index like uh, Nifty and, and Bank Nifty. Yeah. Yeah, it should work. I mean, it, it, all of my spreadsheets work for every ticker from every country. So what you can do is just ask in the course, right? And maybe provide a screen print of the issue uh, and my staff will help you immediately. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, we have three war fronts uh, open now. Uh, maybe the world is going to be difficult next year and the year forward. Uh, by the way, BlackRock is looking uh, at for an Ethereum ETF and also Hong Kong is looking for uh, ETFs uh, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really... So when, when, when we first heard about the SEC blessing of the Bitcoin ETF, I became even more bullish longer term. And I'll tell you why. So when in 2004, the gold ETF was created, GLD. And this allowed institutional retail investors to comfortably invest in gold. It's liquid GLD. You can sell it quickly if you want to. And it's real gold. You know, before 2004, I didn't own as much gold because I would go downtown to try to buy gold bars and I wasn't sure if it was legit. So I wouldn't buy as much. Now the same thing uh, with the Bitcoin uh, ETF and crypto ETFs in general. You know, uh, up until recently, if you wanted to securely buy and own uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, you had to get a Ledger Nano, right? Uh, or, or some kind of cold storage wallet. And the way these things work is you have to enter in a gazillion passwords and it's so complicated. And at the last second after you set it up, you're like, dude, I don't know if this is going to work. So I'm going to cut my order in half. Well, now you can comfortably buy Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies after you do your research using ETFs. And there's a reason why I haven't even opened this thing. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Founder Blackstone, of course. Yeah, I, sh I should have known that. Yeah. Is that how you spell his name? Yeah. Okay. Uh, ne next up, uh, Renvier wrote, uh, hey, Chris, my agency is officially launched. Congratulations. We offer services like WhatsApp AI chatbots, automatic social media news posts, and even uh, automations that read images and put data into Google Sheets. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and if you guys want to learn more about how to do uh, basic and advanced AI stuff, just do a search on Luca Anison. Um, Luca has taught me a ton about AI. He's a, I proudly partner with him. I'm going to his wedding uh, this September uh, in Serbia as well. Uh, and Renvir, I'm looking, if you want, you can show me what you've done uh, at 10 a.m. today during our weekly one hour uh, Zoom call for Silver students. Yeah. David Chappelle. I love the name. Uh, my favorite comedian, too. And I use TikTok. I watch probably one or two Chappelle TikToks every day in, in my feed, crying, laughing. Love the guy. Uh, so David wrote, is a hedge fund, uh, mutual fund industry dying? Yeah. I, I'd say it's becoming less relevant because of the, uh, the onset of, of ETFs, right? So I don't know why anybody would ever buy a mutual fund. And these mutual fund companies have longstanding relationships with human resources at big companies. And they, they lobby as well in DC a lot. And they spend billions of dollars in advertising. But it's a scam because mutual funds massively underperform index funds. And when it comes to hedge funds as well, hedge fund performance has gone down a lot. Uh, over the years. And one of the reasons is because the Obama administration kind of cracked down on insider information, right? So not as many hedge funds are performing. Now, most hedge funds are ethical. I believe that with my heart, but a lot of them are unethical. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Plus uh, in, in, 2000, in the year 2000, um, something called Regulation FD or Fair Disclosure was created to the extent that you and I as retail investors have the exact same information at the same time. 
that all the big institutional investors do. It's called regulation FD. So the alpha or edge they can generate over us continues to deteriorate. Yeah. These big funds have nothing on you. And in my MBA program, I teach you all their secrets in terms of how they invest. Yeah. And never listen to anybody in terms of what to buy. Like nobody is smarter than you. Always do your own research. Don't listen to me. I'll never tell you what stock to buy. You know, my, my goal is to teach you how to fish. So you'll eat for a lifetime instead of providing you with a fish where you eat for a day. Okay. Um, uh, and then uh, Manas wrote, um, why is a Bitcoin ETF worth 50 bucks uh, and Bitcoin is 60 now? Uh, how does the math work? And why should I feel optimistic about it? Yeah, I, I'm not sure which which exact ETF you're talking about. But, but in general, um, you can't look at the absolute price of an individual stock, right? Because what if a stock splits, right? It just the mechanics might be completely different. Yeah. Or that ETF might, I don't know which one it is, might be sitting on a lot of cash to deploy. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But it should be priced for perfection. Otherwise the ARBs, uh, arbitrage firms from a venture driven perspective would make sure it's in whack. It's priced accordingly. Now, one reason it might not be priced accordingly ETF you're looking at is because of it's illiquid. Make sure it's very liquid. Yeah. And I can go to more details on that if you like me to. Thanks. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Motivation Station wrote, uh, hey, Chris, good to see you. Good to see you, too, after two weeks. Thank you. That's the longest I've ever taken off for this weekly call, too, man. Yeah. Uh, you think, what do you think of Devon AI? It was a great marketing move. I think most of the AI stuff is hype. Uh, what do you think? I don't have too much experience with that. Yeah, so I'm not the right person to ask. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question is from Matt, which is Skittles or Mike and Ike's? Skittles. Mike and Ike's a little bit spicy for me. Yeah, I like Skittles. They're, they're smaller, too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Renvir wrote, definitely stay long-term focused. Amen. One month ago, my crypto options portfolio was near 4X. Wow. And today it's near zero. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Always long-term focused. Yeah. Um, and the worst thing you can do is 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 if we, we start to day trade and we make money right away. That's a problem. I'll tell you why. It's like going to a casino. For the first time you go to a casino, you get a quarter, you throw in a slot machine, you win, you win 10 grand. That's the worst thing that can happen because psychologically and subconsciously you think it's repeatable, but it's not. Yeah. Yeah. And who the hell knows where the market's going to go one day to the next? I don't know what saber rattling is going to occur between, you know, uh, between China uh, and the United States and other countries as well. I don't know what the Federal Reserve is going to say next. I don't know what the next economic data point is going to be. And each month has 20 trading days, meaning 20 weekdays when the market's open. And stocks go up and down in a short amount of time for, for random reasons. And there's a great book by uh, Nicholas Taleb called Fooled by Randomness. Please read it. Yeah. You, you got to think longer term always. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, Tesla is in free fall. Uh, from 300, yeah, it's almost 150 and even lower. EV buzz in US and Europe has gone. Also, China is dumping heavily. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. 10,000 EV products. Yeah, it's a headache. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm bullish on the market longer term, uh, but they definitely have excess inventory issues that they're working through. Yeah. And, and never invest in a clean tech company or an EV company um, based solely on government subsidies. That's dangerous. Because what happens is when push comes to shove and economies roll over and they always do business as cyclical, these subsidies get cut. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the fall of 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working, um, Spain, which was one of the largest solar markets in the world, they subsidized solar panels uh, for retail uh, or for, for anybody building a house. They got rid of that subsidy and a lot of countries did and the entire market collapsed. You got to make sure these companies can stand their own two feet. Uh, without government subsidies. And I'll give you a great example of this. Um, so uh, Michael Porter, who's a, a brilliant Harvard Business School professor, uh, he came up with the Porter Five Forces model. He wrote this great book in 2000 called Can Japan Compete? And of course, Japan can compete. I love Japan. But what he did was he analyzed the Japanese economy. And he found that after World War II, when the Japanese economy was, was in shambles for obvious reasons, after World War II, the Japanese government, as a way to prop up the Japanese economy, what they did was they gave subsidies to every single sector in the economy to rebuild, except for two sectors. One was autos, didn't get any money, and consumer electronics didn't get any money either. And you know, two of the most 
successful sectors of Japanese companies are definitely uh, uh, autos and, and consumer electronics. And so the bottom line is we can't be reliant on government subsidies for any business model, especially when it comes to clean tech. You got to make sure these companies can stand their own two feet. Okay. Uh, Enter Ben, great to see you. It's been a while. How are you? I'm, I'm always great. Thanks. Uh, and then uh, Lem, uh, Lemmy Kell wrote, uh, who's the AI guy? Yeah, so the AI guy is um, Luca, Luca Anison. So I, I partner with, uh, with, with Luca on, on a bunch of courses. Um, and by the way, earlier today, I talked about repurposing content, kind of like Nintendo has done over the years. Whenever I make a course, I'll export the closed captions into a book. Yeah, you repurpose your, your, your content that way. Yeah. And in my, my Python course, I have a 980 page Python book. It's a long course. Yeah. Helps you work smarter, not harder. And, and by the way, don't pay services like rev.com uh, for captions. What I want you all to do is I want you to download this product called Descript. Descript is an AI product. It's 20 bucks a month uh, and it does all my captions for me. So I'm saving over $1,000 a month now by not using rev.com. I love AI. It's disrupting every industry. Yeah, it's helping us to, I don't know, be more productive too. All right. Uh, and then Laxay wrote a very interesting personal finance course. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and then uh, next up here, give me one second. Uh, Manas wrote about Dave Chappelle, the comedian. He's crazy good. So is uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah, I watched Joe Rogan. Uh, and, and that, who, yeah. Who is a good friend of The Rock? Don't remember his name. Yeah, I, I don't know that person's uh, name either. Uh, but but I did see Dave Chappelle here at the Google Amphitheater years ago. One of my investors from Dubai had an extra ticket. I've never laughed as hard as I did watching Chappelle. It, it's not his jokes only. It's his delivery. You know, and as Maya Angelou once said, people might not remember what you said, but they'll never forget the way you made them feel. And his delivery is magic. Yeah, it's so funny. Okay. All right. Renvier wrote, if you had to start a hedge fund today, um, how would you stay relevant? Like why would someone even invest in a hedge fund and not an ETF? Yeah. You have to talk about what differentiates your fund, right? So for me, many, many years ago, when I launched my hedge fund, um, what I did was I, I focused on two different sectors, technology and industrials, cyclical stocks, because there's not a high correlation between those two. And it's a good way to, to mitigate portfolio volatility and all that stuff. Yeah. You need a track record too, of course. Yeah. But but it is hard. It's much more competitive. Yeah. I'd probably think about how to leverage AI. There's got to be a way to do it. And only one, one hedge fund, there's only really one hedge fund in history that's really nailed using AI to make billions. Uh, and that's Renaissance Technologies. And you can Google this, but Jim Simmons, who started Renaissance after he left the NSA in the 80s, um, his average gross average return since the 80s until today is 60%. It's a big hedge fund. And what they do is they have thousands of Linux servers running in parallel that are heavily guarded. And nobody knows what's in those Linux servers. But they use machine learning, AI, et cetera, to pick stocks. And they'll never let anybody know what's in them, of course, in those servers. Why would you? Um, and I'll give you an example. And this is a silly example, but it'll help us understand uh, how these algorithms work. So one of, the, one of the inputs he might have in his Linux servers is something like this. If it's raining a lot, then short restaurant stocks. Because when it rains a lot, people don't go to dinner as, as much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Casper uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, I uh, hope you're doing well. <clears throat> uh, good to see you. Uh, can you please explain why do some stocks get halted after going up 15% uh, and others can run 200% with no restrictions? Is it because of margin calls? No, it's not because of that. Um, so, so what the exchanges do is they, they halt stocks um, if big news comes out okay, or is about to come out. And, and what can happen is uh, investor relations or CFO of a company can talk to the exchange uh, just to let them know that there might be some news coming. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes it's not up to the company itself. It's up to the exchange. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's there to help you. And there's other rules too. Like, for example, um, you're not allowed to short a hedge fund if it keeps, if a stock keeps going. Sorry, you're not allowed to short a stock if, if a stock keeps going down. So the exchanges have something called the plastic rule, right? So you can't short 
unless it goes up a little bit. And the reason is, otherwise stocks could be in free fall. And what the exchanges try to do is they try to mitigate volatility always because volatility leads to fear. Yeah, and panic. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, next up, uh, Elon. And, and by the way, stocks that are extraordinarily volatile, uh, meaning like the one you mentioned, it goes up 200%. It's probably a, a, a small cap uh, that's not that liquid. So just be careful with, with, with illiquid stocks. Yeah. Um, and, and you mentioned margin call, but it, it's sometimes stocks can go up a lot because of a short squeeze, right? It could be margin call related, but likely not. Um, so I'll give you an example. Back in, in January of 2021, uh, GameStop went up 29.4 times in the month of January uh, alone because of a short squeeze. Yeah. And, and typically, generally speaking, when, when a short doesn't go down on multiple negative news data points, all the negative news is priced in, so get out. Similarly, if you're long a stock, you own a company, and there's lots of positive news comes out and the stock doesn't go up, well, it's probably over-owned. It's a crowded long. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes the best way to understand when to start accumulating uh, in a stock after you've done the research um, is if it doesn't go down bad news. Because that could lead to panic short covering. And the stock might have already found a floor. Yeah. Of course, you have to do a lot more research than just that. Yeah. Okay. And then Manas wrote, uh, Elon is charging new users to use X, formerly Twitter, and also to delete accounts. He is charging money. Apparently, his AI is being trained on our X data. Uh, how is that fair? And how is that free speech? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't aware he was deleting accounts. Um, so I don't mind paying, uh, I don't use Twitter, um, but I have an account and I do pay, uh, for verification, kind of like how I'm, I'm, I'm verified now on Instagram and I pay a monthly fee. I don't mind doing that. Um, it, it's the only way to stop scammers, uh, from, you know, trying to be me and trying to scam people out of getting cryptos, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, in terms of a free speech, um, I, th I think he's more of a, a free speech uh, advocate. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of using AI to analyze tweets, um, as long as it's done ethically, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, like, for example, uh, um, Reddit, which went public you know, a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I read their S1 filing, right, the, the, the IPO prospectus. And part of their long-term strategy is to leverage AI with the data that, that they collect uh, on Reddit. Yeah, I, I love Reddit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the same thing with, with Udemy. As I think about Udemy longer term, I think what, one of the most incredible things about that company um, is you know the transcripts of, of all the lectures and the Q and A, etc. You know, it's an it's an AI goldmine longer term. Um, it, it'll be interesting to, to to see how Reddit kind of does that with their API. I, I don't know how they're going to do it, but it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, and and I'm I'm restricted uh, on self restricted uh, on on thoughts on Udemy. Um, just because there's a conflict of interest. And I signed NDA with them as well. Yeah. It just wouldn't be ethical for me to. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Renvir wrote, can I track IBIT cash transactions? Uh, I'm not too familiar with that. So sorry. Yeah. But if you want today during the silver call at 10 a.m. over Zoom, show me exactly what you mean. I'll give you my, my humble thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Manas wrote, uh, is option trading also trading and not investing? Because, you know, uh, it's like a month or something short term. It's a great question. Great question. So the way to think about options is this. It's like an insurance policy. Okay. So um, let's say that you own a ton of Coca-Cola stock. Okay. And it's 99% of your net worth. And it's gone up a lot. And you don't want to sell it because you don't want to pay taxes, but you're worried it could crash. Well, you could buy an insurance policy on this just in case. And that's a put. You buy a, a put on Coca-Cola to your KO. So if Coke goes down, this will go up in price. And all you lose if Coke goes up is this here. Yeah. And a lot of people do that, insurance contracts. And even uh, probably the best example of this is um, there's something called a zero cost caller. And this is what uh, Mark Cuban did with Yahoo. So Mark Cuban's company, Broadcast.com, was purchased by Yahoo in the late 90s for $5.7 billion. 
Um, and out of that, uh, uh, Mark Cuban got $1.4 billion. And he was restricted. He couldn't sell his Yahoo stock for a while. So he wanted to remain a billionaire. And so what he did was he put on this position where he, he and don't do this because this is risky, but he owned a ton of Yahoo stock. In order to, to, to hedge that, he bought a lot of puts just in case. But those puts were expensive. So what he did to finance the puts was he, he sold calls, right? And, and so the, the, the money from the calls paid for the puts. And he held that trade for a couple of years and people thought he was crazy doing it. Uh, and he preserved about 90% of that $1.4 billion. Yeah. yeah. So that's, you can think about uh, options as, as being insurance that way. Or what you can do is this. You can be long-term focused with options. After you do your due diligence on a company, and if you think a company is a five by five, meaning a 500% return within five years, then what you can do is you can buy leaps, which are calls that expire in like one, two or three years. Yeah. But, but think of, always think of options like it's a insur life insurance policy. Yeah. And so I pay a life insurance policy and God forbid something happens to me. I, I am worth more dead than alive, by the way. But we pay this much every month for my life insurance account. Um, and if, if God forbid I, I pass away and my family gets a massive amount, right? But if not, hopefully, I hope I lose this much every month. Yeah. Okay. Great question, Manas. All right, moving on to Nathy wrote, have you read Where Money Comes From? Uh, I, I have not read that, sorry. Yeah. yeah. What book am I reading now? Alexa, read my book. Getting your selection from Audible. Resuming $100 million leads. Alexa, cool. stop. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I'm reading a, a book right now. And sometimes what I do is I, I, I read a book and I listen to it as, as well. So uh, this is Alex Hermosi. He's got $100 million offer, $100 million leads. Um, uh, and so I'm going through this because I'm putting a lot of pressure on myself to uh, to build a, a, a thousand schools in Africa. And I can get the cost down to hundred grand on them. Uh, and so a, a, a thousand schools times a hundred thousand dollars is a hundred million dollars. Yeah. But as James Cameron said, if you set your goal so high and you fail, you still fail above everyone else's expectations. And if I was a quota carrying sales rep, I'd be fired so many times because I'm the eternal optimist. Okay. Uh, and then Renvier wrote, by the way, Arc Venture Fund invests in open AI. Yeah. It might be the next uh, play after Microsoft. Yeah. They're going to do exceptionally well. Of course, Microsoft's the biggest investor as well. Uh, and Manas wrote, I have an issue with EV uh, because it burns uh, fossil fuel. Fuel. Um, give me one second, please, guys. Um, sometimes it, it, it jumps on me. Ah. Yeah, I have an issue with EV because it burns coal for electricity in retrospect. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. I, I understand. It, and it's, it, it is a dilemma because it, 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 I have a Tesla uh, and, you know, it's my wife's car. We plug it in, we charge it. But the electricity comes from the grid or we have solar on the roof that helps. But a lot of people, when they charge their Tesla, they don't know if the, the electricity being produced to charge it is coal-based. Yeah. And about 30% of... All the pollution above the San Francisco Bay Area apparently is from mainland China. And China is starting to do a much better job, too, of, of cracking down on the 4,000 uh, filthy coal mines they have. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next question is, Japan is re reviving again, my mentor. And what makes Japan so successful yet such a small GDP for decades? Yeah, it's still, still a top five uh, uh, country GDP-wise uh, gl globally. Um, so what's happening right now with Japan is it's been unloved for decades, right? And the Nikkei peaked around 1990. And finally, it passed that peak recently. And I think what's happening is a lot of people that invest in Asia are worried about uh, geopolitical issues with China right between the lines. Uh, and so they want to get exposure in Asia and they're investing in Japan. And Japan is, is a value investor's dream because a lot of companies are trading at very low valuations. Um, so it's just, it's just a thematic play for the next year or two, I think. Yeah. And I did a lot of work when I worked at Goldman on Japanese equities. I love Japan, but I'm really worried about Japan in, in the long run structurally because the population of Japan right now is 130 million people. And in a couple decades, it's going to be 80 million people. People just aren't having kids anymore. Yeah. 
I hope they turn around. Okay, uh, and then Benny wrote, uh, Chris, are you religious? Yeah, very. Yeah. So what I do every morning before I get out of bed to put myself in a peak mental state is uh, I thank God for, uh, for, t for 10 things in this order. Here we go. Uh, I start my day with gratitude. I say, thank you, God, for Andrew, Matthew, Dylan, Christine, my wife, my mom, my dad, my brother, uh, Jamie, my sisters, Katie, Elizabeth, and, and all of you, my students. I practice gratitude. Then I read a, a chapter of the Bible uh, on, my, uh, on my Kindle every morning and i'll tell you what bible it is if, if you care yeah and, and i don't really worry about about stuff in in life because god already knows what's going to happen and that puts me at ease and and every setback i've had in my life and your life too maybe you, know, you might not understand it now but years later you look back and you might be grateful for that career relatively speaking uh, setback and so we, we tend to over worry and, and we really have to stop worrying. And right here, um, I got a great quote here from Dale Carnegie, which is, our fatigue is often caused not by work, but by worry. And Sir Winston Churchill once said, I met a man on his, I met a man on his deathbed who talked about all the worries he had in his life, none of which came true. Akuna yeah. Matata. Things are never as bad as we think. Okay. Um, next up, uh, 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 Casper wrote, uh, what is the best way to search for upcoming catalysts uh, in a company? Yeah. Let me answer it a different way. So sometimes when I invest, what I'll do is I'll come up with a theme like AI, for example, a couple of years ago, whatever it was. I like AI. How do I invest? Then I go to ETFDB.com. That's ETFDatabase.com. And I find ETFs that maybe are AI focused or something. Then I look at the components. So that's top down. I'm bullish. Then I look at the components of that ETF, all the companies, and I start doing research on those individual companies. Yeah. So I start top down uh, and then bottoms up. Um, now, in terms of catalysts in general, um, it, it's different for every company, right? So, for example, and, and I met with a CFO of, of Vestas, a wind company, in my office in 2007 years ago in San Francisco. And he told me, he actually told me the Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. He said, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be. And you want to invest in companies that people are going to like. And using that methodology, you, you, you don't, don't invest in what people like now. Invest in what people are going to like longer term. So you look for catalysts. So for example, uh, in early 2012, uh, we invested uh, in Lionsgate Film. A good friend of mine, Brian Carter, came up with the idea. Ticker LGF. And at that point in time, January 2012, I'd, I'd read the Hunger Games books, or almost finished them. And uh, Lionsgate film ticker LGF announced that they're going to be making, you know, Hunger Games movies. And so I thought, hey, that's great. We have three catalysts over the next six years. Every two years, a new, new Hunger Games movie. They made a fourth one. They kind of yeah, made, made too many of them. Uh, but that's how I thought about it with them. And, and a lot of times with, with video game companies like Take-Two, ticker TTWO, you know, Rockstar's company. Uh, you know, big catalyst is going to be GTA 6. Uh, and so you want to buy stocks that investors are going to like because of an upcoming catalyst. Yeah. And there's other examples I can give as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then now they wrote, I think Kenny G's uh, returns are 100% legit. I, I don't know who that is. But I know he plays the sax. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Manas wrote, um, can internal debt crumble a country? Has there been a case like that uh, to much internal debt where debt like GP 60%? Y yeah, it, it can destroy a company. It certainly can. Yeah. And um, we had the Latin American debt crisis in 1994, right? That, that destroyed Argentina, a lot, a lot of countries. And even Venezuela, um, they actually had to scrap their entire currency a couple of years ago uh, called the Venezuelan Fuerte. Fuerte is, is, means strong in Spanish. Yeah, so it can definitely do it. Now, in terms of why is it not happening in the U.S. economy? Because the U.S. economy was set up from day one by, you know, by Andrew Jackson and founding fathers, whatever, uh, to be the, the the lender of last resorts. You know, Andrew Jackson, he's the guy in the $20 bill. He looks like Keith Richards. Um, and, and everything is relative, right? And so as I mentioned earlier, I humbly believe the very last company, so to speak, in the plants go belly up would be the U.S. government. And 
if, if U.S. debt instruments collapse, I think it hurts China more than U.S. because China owns a ton of U.S. treasuries and also China's biggest export market is the United States. Now, the Chinese government, what they're doing is they're trying to create their own domestic economy to the extent that they're not as reliant on the U.S. in the long run. Yeah. Remember, investing is all relative. All right, next up, I've got here... Yeah, Ren Bureau, can you talk a little bit more about the fact that you cannot short uh, if a stock keeps going down? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, years ago, uh, the the uh, the SEC created uh, the plus tick rule. Then they got rid of it uh, around 08 or so, and then they brought it back a couple of years ago. And what it means is this. So you physically, the exchanges will not let you short a stock if it keeps going down, right? So if it goes down, and then somebody buys a share and it pushes up a little bit, then you can short. If it keeps going down, you can't short. But if it goes up a little bit, like 1% or something, then you can short. And that stops stocks from going like this, like catch a falling knife. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then uh, Manos wrote, uh, last month you said if a stock's under four bucks, it's delisted. Uh, what is that rule? I, I've not seen too much where stocks blow a dollar in New York Stock Exchange. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So generally speaking, what happens is in order for in order for exchanges to make sure all the companies listed on the exchanges are, are legit uh, uh, and, and rock solid from a, from a financial perspective, if a stock drops below a certain dollar amount for a certain amount of time, they get delisted. And what that means is they become part of what's called the pink sheets. And if, if a stock has a ticker of four letters, it turns into five letters for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes companies will do reverse splits as well um, to, to get around that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Motivation Station wrote, do we need to be good with numbers to pursue a career uh, in, in finance? Yeah. 75% of all jobs in the financial services industry are sales oriented. So not necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you don't have to be a math wizard, right? There's not that much complicated mathematics uh, in, in finance unless you want to you know, look at options. Yeah. Uh, next up, Amazon wrote, uh, how might the economies of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region transition in a post-oil era? And what alternate strategies could they employ to maintain uh, economic uh, stability? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a... A very famous Saudi Aramco executive many years ago who said the Stone Age did not end because they ran out of stones, right? And so I think Saudi Arabia is looking closely at, at, at how to do this or kind of maybe they'll turn themselves into a tourism-based uh, uh, economy, a longer term, kind of like what, what the UAE has done with, with Dubai. Um, I don't know. But they're, they, you've got to be willing to take on risks. Like one of the issues with, with Dubai, and I love Dubai. I have a lot of investors there when I used to work in the venture capital industry. One of the issues with Dubai is it's not worth it to take a risk because if you're not a Dubai national and you start a company and you fail, you get kicked out of the country, right? So mentality has to change the extent that, yeah, it makes sense to take risks. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I, my, my answer is always education. Always. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, and then uh, Renbeer wrote, uh, you said an interesting thing, AI gold mine. Maybe for the next 10 years, the bull case is only AI gold mines. Yeah, no, I, I'm very bullish on AI launcher. Now, if you're not sure what AI products to use or what AI companies to, to invest in, um, here's what I recommend doing. Okay, I gave a speech recently to, to Workday and Adele, uh, and, and I mentioned this. So you go to Sequoia's website. So it's sequoiacap.com. And this is the best venture capital firm in history. And they do the work for you because here on their website, uh, they've got something called Generate AI Act 2. And I'm sure they'll release Act 3 and Act 4 soon as well. And what this means is if you scroll down here, uh, you'll see a chart. And this chart here will tell you what companies Sequoia thinks are going to be successful in AI. Now, not all of them are pure plays, but many of them are. So this is the entire consumer market here, medical advice, gaming, etc. cetera. Uh, then you've got enterprise here, sales, you know, customer support, et cetera. And if you're super techie, then you can look at the AI infrastructure stack right here. Um, and they'll be updating this, uh, I'm sure, quite often. You can always go here. 
sequoiacap.com to look at this because Sequoia has already done the research for you. And this might be a good starting point for you to, to do due diligence uh, on companies. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, next up, a Nintendo wrote, uh, hey, do you, do you think it's important uh, for startup founders to have general knowledge about how much their startup is worth uh, when they go and meet uh, with, with venture capital firms? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and the best way to understand what, what a startup is worth is to create financial statements just forecast your income statement, you know, five or 10 years in the future. Uh, and then you can value the company based on a revenue multiple or earnings multiple uh, long, longer term. Yeah. But, but they, look, VCs understand that it, it's early days for, for companies that are just getting started. And they know that your business model is going to change materially. In fact, whenever you provide venture capital firms with your financial statements, they always cut them in half. Yeah. Because they know entrepreneurs by nature are very optimistic. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, next question is, what would you advise a startup founder in trying to value the startup what method? Yeah, yeah, so I, I would use um, price to revenue because um, the company's probably not profitable right away. Uh, and then I'd use a, a price earnings multiple longer term or what you can do is, is even this because it's, it's tough. A third way to look at it is you can think about the total addressable market, size it, uh, and then think about what percent of that market you're gonna get. But valuation is always relative to the market in which a company is in. Yeah. So look at similar companies, see what they're trading at. All right. All right. Next up. Okay. Uh, Nathy wrote, can you explain uh, derivatives as a whole if it isn't uh, on older videos? Yeah. Yeah. So so in, in calculus class, a derivative means a rate of change, right? And so derivatives are instruments, are ways to invest that will invest in the rate of change and help to protect your capital as well. And the global derivatives market is six times bigger than the global stock market. It's massive. And within the derivatives umbrella are several different classes of, of, of assets. One being options like puts and calls. You also have futures, swaps, uh, and, and much more as, as well. Yeah, it gets pretty complicated, yeah. And, and what, I, what I'm working on uh, next actually is uh, I'm creating uh, uh, the, the big short uh, a video on this on my YouTube channel, just a review of the movie, and I'll explain derivatives in much more detail, and you'll understand why Warren Buffett in 2008 called derivative financial weapons of mass destruction. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Renbeer wrote, uh, how do people like Mark Cuban play such a trade? I mean, the zero cost caller, yeah. Um, do they use Robinhood like us? No. Now, the, the way it works is um, when an investment bank advises a company, right? So um, I think it was uh, Goldman Sachs advised Yahoo, uh, and then uh, uh, Morgan Stanley advised uh, Broadcast.com on the deal. And so what Cuban probably did was he probably called up the investment bankers after the deal was done uh, on, um, uh, on Broadcast.com and said, can I please talk to somebody in your private wealth management department that can set up an option strategy to protect my $1.4 billion from this broadcast.com deal. Yeah, yeah. And, and usually, like, even the buy side, like, we think that a lot of hedge funds are very sophisticated when it comes to options. The harsh reality is, you know, most most uh, hedge funds on the buy side, they get the sell side to structure these complicated option strategies for them, like a Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, UBS, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and then Casper wrote, uh, why buy ETFs instead of copying their holdings or perhaps choosing 10 to 20 favorite stocks from their portfolio? You can certainly do that. It just takes time. Yeah, it takes time. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes what will happen is, say you want to get exposure to the S&P 500, you don't have time to replicate that portfolio. What, what, what happens is the S&P 500 rebalances every now and then, meaning some companies are taken out, new ones are put in. And it's a pain in the neck to try to always analyze that where Vanguard and ETF company can do that for you. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes the fees of you buying individual stocks, the fees actually end up being more than the fee you would pay 
to invest in an ETF uh, like ticker VU uh, for the S&P 500. Yeah. Uh, Amr wrote, uh, hey, Chris, good to see you likewise. I'm taking a couple of your courses at Udemy. Thank you. You wrote, man, I love your style. Thank you. Um, I'm a freelance financial analyst. Uh, any advice uh, for, for me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, cons the consulting business is very fragmented in the United States. In North America, there's over 100,000 consulting firms. So if you're freelancing as a financial analyst, you kind of have your own consulting firm. So what I would do is step one, register your company, right? Step two, uh, I become a prolific writer on LinkedIn, right? Like write one article every single week on whatever it is you do in finance. So you can be thought of as a thought leader. And eventually, as I mentioned earlier, you take all those articles, you put it together into a book. And when you're trying to drum or get business, you can bring your book to meet with prospects. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it's a tough gig uh, being a consultant um, because it's, it's hard to get clients. And so I recommend setting up tons of informational meetings, as I mentioned earlier today. Ask and you'll receive its prophetic. has been true since the beginning of time and closed mouths don't get fed. Thank you. Yeah, and Motivation Station li likes that book uh, by Hermosi as well. It's great. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Chris wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, I I'm doing the MBA silver program. Uh, I want to upgrade to higher because uh, the self-paced silver does not work for me. Okay, you want to do it live in class. Yeah, I need structure and you need accountability as well. Yeah. But meeting other students, I say I would love my heart putting pressure on all of us to, to get it done. Yeah. Um, and then he wrote, can I upgrade now? Uh, and if so, how do I? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you set up a call with me and, and we'll, we'll talk. And anybody interested uh, in, in my MBA program can, can also do that. Um, so I'll show you where to set up the call. So uh, just go to my website um, and underneath this blue button I'm covering here, just click this to set up a, a Zoom call with me. Yeah, and I'll give you an upgrade discount. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Arrow X wrote, uh, for the top MBA schools, if I applied, do I make myself look like a liberal <laughs> applicant for better chances? I don't know how else to put it, LOL. That was a superb question. So what I recommend in general is never put anything on your LinkedIn profile that leads the viewer to believe that you're Democrat or Republican. Now, be careful who you follow as well. Don't follow politicians on your LinkedIn profile or anybody that leans one way or the next. Like, don't follow Fox News. Don't follow CNN. Don't follow either. Maybe follow the BBC. I don't know. I know you're telling yourself, you're like, he you didn't really answer the question. Okay. All right. Give me one second, guys. All right. Next up, I have got a question that's written in Thai. I, I can't read that. Sorry. But what movie is this from? Oh, Jack Talks Thai real good. I don't know if anybody will get that. Yeah. All right, next up, uh, Benny wrote, uh, God bless you, brother. God bless you more. Uh, you wrote, God knows everything. Amen. I totally understand. Many setbacks are paved with blessings later on uh, or a lesson learned. Absolutely. It, you know, there's from the Old Testament, there's the book of Job as well. And Job, uh, J-O-B, prophetically means job. Uh, and it was about this dude that lost a lot of stuff. And then later on, it all made sense, but he didn't lose his faith. Okay, uh, Mason wrote, I'm a Lebanese citizen. Oh, dude, I'm, I'm Lebanese as well. I'm 25% Lebanese. Uh, my mom is, is, is Lebanese. Um, and speaking of leveraging your network, um, so I, I met with John Mack uh, years ago. So he's the, uh, the, the chairman uh, emeritus. He was the CEO of, of Morgan Stanley. And, and after I met with him in New York, uh, I flew back uh, to my office. I worked in VC and this was sitting on my desk. He wrote me a nice, nice note as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many ways to network. So you wrote, uh, I'm a Lebanese uh, citizen living in a corrupt country ruled by uh, corrupt politicians. Um, how do you solve the, the Lebanese issue? Yeah, I, I know it's hard. It's hard. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, and I have, uh, I have relatives that were right beside that bomb at the embassy in 1980. I remember that. Yeah. 
I, I really believe that, not to get too political, but but I believe that with, with guns you can kill you can kill terrorists, but with education you can kill terrorism. And so I really believe the answer to all of our problems, every problem on this planet, is education. Um, yeah. So if, if I were a Lebanese uh, you know, politician uh, and I had any sort of sway, I'd probably come up with a way uh, to make education much more affordable. Yeah. But I know there's so many issues there as well. Yeah. Especially when it comes to Syria and I'm not going to go there. Yeah. But I love you. Okay. John, thank you for that $5 donation. Appreciate that. That will go directly to uh, Project Magoo. Thank you. Uh, so John wrote, um, how do you see the future of ed tech? Uh, I'd love to have uh, your, your intake. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. So I have my own column in Forbes magazine. And recently I wrote an article about the future of education and how I believe that in my lifetime, only 50 universities will still be in existence. Um, it really doesn't make sense for us to spend $100,000 for a four-year undergraduate education where we don't really learn any portable skills. And we come out with a lot of debt as well. So what I think ultimately is going to happen is there's going to be a ton of online companies like mine, you know, that, that offer degrees or education. And then people will realize that, hey, during COVID, I was able to learn online. I was able to function online. Why do I have to pay 100 grand and drive 8 million miles every single day uh, to go to an office building or go to university, so to speak? And so ultimately what I think is going to happen is um, initially... Alumni, uh, the, the endowments will be depleted. And then there's going to be a last ditch effort, you know, Hail Mary type pass rescue to try to rescue a lot of universities. And, you know, alumni will donate and donate, uh, but they just won't make it. And then people will start to think, well, I'm not going to go to university uh, unless I can, you know, get a good brand like a, like a Harvard or Oxford, Cambridge, whatever. Um, and so people decide not to do so. Yeah, and I really do believe that uh, ed tech is one of the best secular growth markets you can invest in. You got to be early though, right? With, with every investment. So, like I mentioned earlier, Wayne Gretzky was successful because he skates where the puck is going to be, not to where the puck is right now. And that's how I feel about my business. Like I, I know I'm 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 ahead of the curve humbly, um, but my vision of the world. Um, so I launched this this MBA program back in 2019, uh, and then COVID happened, and my vision of the world was pulled forward by a couple decades. Uh, but I think it's only a matter of time until there's tons of companies just like mine. Yeah. yeah. And if you have follow-up questions, John, please let me know. Thank you for that that as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Motivation Station wrote, uh, do we get complete silver MBA access uh, with the top tier membership uh, of your channel? Yes, you do. That my subscription service, you do. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Sancta 63, um, I, 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 I'm so sorry. I, I can't understand that. Um, if, if you, maybe you, you signed up through Sasha Stevenson, um, I think for Indonesia, uh, the Indonesian product. Uh, so Sasha is a, a good friend of mine. I made a YouTube course over years ago. She's got over a million followers. Um, so if you want, what you can do is translate that use google translate translate that into english uh, and, I'll, and i'll answer yeah and you get you get live captions as well using youtube which you can translate back yeah all right um uh, next up Manastro, india doesn't have a single ai company uh, or an ev company really no, no ev company i'm surprised that i would have thought that tata might have had some subsidies that, that did some of that uh neither a tech company India has lots of tech companies. Emphasis, Ypro, uh, Satyam, tons. Yeah, tons. Yeah. Um, and you don't know, you wrote, I don't know why, but we lack leadership and execution. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think there's there's a ton of incredible uh, technology companies uh, in India. Yeah. Uh, EV, I'd be surprised if there isn't some. Maybe maybe you look at like Crompton and, Magri Crompton and Greaves or, or Mahindra to see if they have some you know EV subsidiaries as well. Yeah. And I know about AI, you mentioned that before, that there, there's government crackdown on that. Yeah. And I understand why. Uh, then you wrote... Yeah. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> uh, now he wrote, uh, you meant uh, Ken Griffin, not the saxophone player. He wrote Kenny G. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. When, when I, I saw Kenny G, I thought of like Zamfir, the old. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, definitely legit. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a lot, I've got a lot of respect for, for Ken. Uh, I worked at Citadel years ago. Yeah. It's a good company. Okay, Casper um, uh, wrote, can you please also explain why did iShare tips dip in 2022 uh, while inflation uh, what was was spiking? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, uh, Manas, thank you so much for that, those emojis. God bless you more, buddy. Um, and then Renvir wrote, I read something yesterday that most ETFs get zero inflows uh, a daily. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're investing in ETFs, just do invest in the, the big boys, yeah, the, the reputable ones, uh, like 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 Schwab, uh, as well as uh, my favorite one, which which is Vanguard. Yeah, and be careful with liquidity with ETFs as well. Most of them are incredibly illiquid. Yeah, make sure that you never buy more than ten percent of the average daily trading volume, so you can get in and out quickly if need be. Yeah, and you can always look at the difference between the bid and the ask spread to see if they're liquid or not. If they're so wide you can drive a truck through them, then just be careful. You don't need to do that. Yeah. So go to etfdb.com and do research. Okay. Uh, Devon wrote, hey, Chris, how are you? I'm always good, thanks. Uh, I want to know a good broker to buy uh, long-term ETFs, please. Yeah. So it, it, it all depends where you're located. So what I would do is, depending on which country people are located in, what I want you to do is get a list of the top five banks in your country and then call each one of those banks and ask them to transfer you to their brokerage department. That most of them have big brokerage departments to buy stocks. Um, and then what you do is you ask what the commission structure is. Yeah, you rinse, lather, repeat, do with all five, whatever has lowest commission structure. That's who you invest through. And they probably have uh, ETFs available as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Renvir wrote, uh, uh, how hard should you work on your business to make your first million before the age of, of 25? Yeah. God, I don't think I took a single day off in my 20s. Yeah. Why don't you ask me in more detail uh, on the silver call? It starts in 18 minutes, the Zoom call, uh, and, and I'll give you a lot of tips. Yeah. Thanks. All right. And Arrow wrote, I laughed so hard at your answer. I understand it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Please laugh at me, not with me. Yeah. All right. And Jasper wrote, uh, hey, Chris. Uh, hey, Jasper. Good to see you, man. Hope, hope your, your Pokemon trading business is going well. Uh, you wrote, uh, how late is he gold and platinum office hours? Yeah. So it's every single Thursday. And because you graduated from, I think, platinum uh, two years ago. Uh, it's every single Thursday, meaning today, from 11.20 until 1.20. Yeah, so be there right at 11.20. Uh, and it's the same Zoom you used before. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Cheese Nacho uh, wrote, um, any advice for getting into commodity trading, like Glencore, Trafigure? Yeah, I'm an economic student in Europe. And you're, I loved your content and learning it every time I watched. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So like anything else, it's, it's, it's through networking, right? So what I would do is I would set up networking meetings uh, at the larger banks because they can take a risk and hire an intern, whereas startups, usually they, they don't have payroll for that. Uh, I would set up 20 or 30 informational meetings with each bank you want to work at. Yeah, that, that's what I would do. And it's just rewind at the beginning of the video for, for, for details on, on what to do in those informational meetings. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you're in Europe, I'd probably reach out to, I don't know, like UBS and Deutsche Bank is massive as well. Barclays, uh, et cetera. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then Satons, Mark, how are you, buddy? Great, great to see you. Mark always types in caps. Uh, he's from Michigan. He graduated like three years ago from my, my MBA program. Great to see you. Always write in caps. I love it because it reminds me of my grandfather. I miss you, Gramps. Although my grandfather wasn't yelling. He just typed in caps always. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Mark wrote, uh, hey, brother, great to see you. Great to see you too. Uh, can you tell me who I should go to for setting up international bank accounts? Uh, also, what do you think is the future of crypto? Yeah. Yeah. 
So I usually deal with lawyers when I do that, securities lawyers. So when I open up my, my offshore bank in the British Virgin Islands, uh, I dealt directly with a securities lawyer. Yeah. Um, you might be able to do it through through a city or JP Morgan as well, just uh, opening up uh, accounts overseas for whatever reason it is. You want to open them. Yeah. Yeah. Probably for tax savings. And you wrote, what do you think is the future of, of crypto? Well, I've, I've said for years that I, I believe that 95% of cryptos are scams. And, and that's why I always say from a, a you know, from a risk management perspective, never put more than 5% of your portfolio in cryptos and never have more than 0.5% in any one crypto. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I think they're going to be more relevant in the long run, but there's going to be a day of reckoning. Like, I, I really hope that the SEC, uh, that the SEC starts to regulate cryptos as well, because before you invest in a stock, you can read uh, an S1 prospectus. I would love to see something like this for cryptos as well, so that you know all the all all the I don't know all, all the risks are, are highlighted here as written by investment bankers uh, and lawyers. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, and then uh, Mr. Vicky wrote, Chris, you said to me on the last Q&A not to day trade. Sounds like something I would say. Uh, you wrote, but I started trading by using uh, average in and average out. I've created a systematic system to get in to trade uh, through mainly uh, managing uh, uh, my position size simple. Yeah, I, I just, I'd be careful and, and I respect everybody's opinions. Uh, but just for me personally, I, I, don't, I don't believe in, in day trading. Okay, Renvier wrote, uh, did that help your business when Forbes and NBC featured you? Um, yeah, it always helps. Yeah. But but when you get one little article written about your one television interview, it, you see a temporary spike in business, uh, but it, it just takes time still. Yeah. Yeah. And when it comes to marketing, like it's marketing is it's like dating, right? Like you don't get married right away. Like before you, I don't know, before you you, you buy a Toyota, you see 20 commercials first. So it takes time. It's not instant gratification like sales. Yeah. Um, but but I really do believe that everybody should be create their own YouTube channel and their own social media content because I think we're all going to look back, you know, decades from now, uh, and say and think of every little video we, we make as being like uh, like a little coffee shop franchise, right? And and YouTube is the only gold rush in history where it costs you nothing to make the product, and YouTube is also the only gold rush in history. Uh, where you can get access to billions of potential customers for free forever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, but but I have reached out, like I, I send emails every now and then to the top journalists in the world, and I say something along the lines of, uh, hope all is well. Um, if you ever want to use me as a resource, uh, I'd be happy to humbly help you when it comes to ed tech, um, as I believe that in the long run, only 50 universities will make it. Thanks a lot, Chris Arun. Yeah. And sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. Like the, the Wall Street Journal, the uh, like the head of the technology section responds to me not, not too long ago. It, it, it works, yeah. yeah. Okay. And then you wrote, if I pay a local news outlet to talk about me, uh, do you think that could work or should I wait for them to, to reach out? Yeah, I wouldn't, I would never pay. And there's a lot of people, I'm not, I'm not gonna say who, uh, that are in business and in finance that pay several hundred thousand dollars to have somebody write a book for them or they pay exactly two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get on the cover of certain magazines yeah i, I don't I, I that's just not for me yeah um i would just keep renvier i would continue to make incredible linkedin content like you do uh and then eventually reach out to, to journalists as well and uh you know be persistent like a pit bull in a pork chop and eventually uh, you will be quoted in, in newspapers etc uh, and then Devon wrote, if anyone will do your MBA program, can they uh, plan for a PhD uh, once they get a, a certificate? Um, what PhD stands for plumbing, heating, and dishwashing? Pizza delivery? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's not, I, I will never do government accreditation because I don't want the government to tell me what I can and cannot teach. And accredited MBA programs teach you crap that's not relevant. They don't teach you the important stuff. I don't want a board of directors or government officers tell me that I have to teach BS theory. 
You know, traditional MBA schools don't teach you the following, and my program does. Traditional MBA schools don't teach you how to sell. That's right. They don't teach you how to interview. They don't teach you how to network. They don't teach you how to present. They don't teach you how to manage your own money. They teach you how to manage other people's money. They also don't teach you how to start a company. Ask anybody who graduated with an MBA from a traditional school. So do you, do you know how to start a company? They don't teach that in business school. It's ridiculous. And it's why I started my business and why I wrote this book uh, as, as well. Yeah. Also, traditional MBA schools don't teach you how to use social media. I do. They don't teach you how to program. I do. They don't teach you relevant stuff to make you successful. They might teach you stuff that was relevant last century. Yeah. Most of them all make it. Okay. All right. Um, and then John wrote, I think for your answer, I totally agree. You're most welcome. Yeah. And then Renvir wrote, the best Indian company is Google, Microsoft, uh, and, and IBM. Yeah. And I'm a huge fan of Asetta and Adela. He was the right choice to become CEO because he started their cloud computing department, meaning Azure. Yeah, I really like him a lot. He's a good guy. Okay, uh, next up, Devon wrote, in India, Tata Motors are heavily into electric cars. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Uh, okay. All right, uh, give me one second here to catch up on questions. Sanjay wrote, is the job market in the United States as bad as the UK or is it better? It, it's better. Yeah, unemployment is, is very, very low right now. Very low. Yeah. US economy is doing well. Yeah. Uh, UK has got a lot of, it's sad, but a lot of structural issues. Yeah. And inflation. Um, and Motivation Station wrote, what's the depth meaning of laugh on me, not with me? No, I said laugh, laugh at me, not, not with me. Yeah. I'm trying to be self-deprecating. Yeah. Hey, Joe. Good to see you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sanjay wrote, I, I knew someone who finished uh, uh, an MS, Master of Science, I guess, in finance from Pace and still looking for work. Uh, is it tough to get a job after an MS? Yeah, I've never worked with anybody uh, that has a Master's of Science in Finance ever. And I've worked, uh, yeah, I've worked at a lot of firms. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, next up... Uh, uh, Manas wrote, um, I don't know how BYD became that cool and famous so quickly, like it was nowhere a few years ago and Warren Buffett invested. Now everyone's there. Yeah. Buffett was talking about BYD a decade ago as, as well. Yeah. I think they're what the number one electric car producer. Yeah. I'm sure they get government subsidies in China. And then Vic wrote, Hey Chris, uh, your course, uh, courses off of you, off of Udemy have been so helpful and accelerated my learnings. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Appreciate it. What's your opinion on Bitcoin having in the coming months and Bitcoin prices? Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you not familiar with um, uh, Bitcoin having, so the having process means this. So about every four years, um, you know, the, the amount of money you can make mining Bitcoin gets cut in half, right? It happened in 2012, 2016, 2020, now 2024, happening right now. Um, and historically, you know, for the past three data point trends we have, um, we, we saw material run up before and afterwards uh, as well, right? So it's definitely a positive thing. The reason it's positive, and the reason they do it is because Satoshi or whoever founded Bitcoin, uh, they hate fiat traditional paper currency because uh, of inflation. So if you cut in half the amount of money that miners can make, right, then it actually counteracts uh, uh, inflation uh, in the long run. So it's definitely a positive catalyst. Yeah. How much is priced in? I don't know. Um, but it's, it's generally speaking a positive catalyst. Yeah. And you've got another positive catalyst, of course, which is the, the ETF catalyst. And people don't realize how big of a deal that is. You know, back in 2012, about 0% of ownership in Bitcoin uh, was from institutional investors. Now it's over 50%. That's a big deal from a supply demand perspective. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Yenny wrote, um, how can you get people to become advocates of you uh, going out of their way to push you forward in the interview process or recommending you in some way? I've been searching for this answer. Yeah, absolutely. So th the best way is to, as I mentioned earlier, bond. 
if you bond with people that you you interview with, meaning your informational means because they have something in common with you, they're going to go to bat for you, right? And so set up those 20 or 30 informational meetings at each company you want to work at. Find something you have in common with people. And in my MBA degree program, especially the Platinum Pro, you can find out more details about tomorrow uh, on my, my webinar. Um, and by the way, don't 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 buy my gold or platinum today because I'm going to put it on, on sale tomorrow during, during the call. I, I got to end this call in a second. Sorry. Um, but if you, you set up a lot of networking meetings, you add a tremendous amount of value, uh, then, then ultimately people are going to help you. But you have to ask. You have to ask them for help because closed mouths don't get fed. And earlier today, I mentioned that I was going to talk about um, sales tips and whatnot. It looks like we run out of time. I'll, I'll do that probably uh, next, next week. Um, everybody, please click the like button. Uh, it just helps my business. Um, and I do have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes. And if you're uh, part of the silver program, uh, like uh, like Renvier is, uh, then um, if you go to the very first lecture of your silver curriculum, uh, then at 10 a.m. today, I'll, I'll do a one-hour Zoom call with you. And if you're in gold and platinum, uh, then we'll do a two-hour call today, uh, starting at, at 11.20 a.m. And if you're platinum students, looking forward to doing one-on-ones with you if, if you set up one-on-ones later today. And for everybody in this call, uh, please join me tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time uh, for my uh, my ninth annual uh, MBA open house. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm going to teach you some groundbreaking things about finance and saving. Um, and also, I'm going to give away uh, two products tomorrow. And then one person that answers a question correctly tomorrow on the call is going to win a 100% scholarship uh, to my, uh, my gold MBA. I hope it's somebody on this call here. Okay. Let me see the last couple of questions here. All right, uh, Nicholas, hey, Nicholas uh, wrote, uh, isn't the unemployment rate low only because people are being forced to have uh, more than one job, especially due to uh, inflation? No, I, I, I think the unemployment rate is, is a little bit artificially low because of retiring baby boomers. So the unemployment rate only consists of people that are looking for work. If you're retired, it obviously doesn't count you. Uh, and every single, this is amazing, but every single week in the United States, 100,000 baby boomers retire. Yeah. So I think that's artificially keeping it low uh, as well. Yeah. And then Sanjay wrote, um, how hard is Python? How long will it take to complete a beginner to learn Python? Do you teach Python? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, in my MBA degree program, I have an elective for that. Um, I think it's about 15 hour course and I teach you to go from zero to hero in 15 hours um, using tons and tons of ridiculous props and Legos. And I actually on the floor, I can't pick it up now, but I've got a 9,200 uh, piece Lego set of Titanic. Uh, that, that's anyway, take the course, you, you'll see why. There's a lot, of, a lot of bad dad humor as, as well. I, I use a lot of Legos to teach it as well. Um, for example, we got all the Star Wars characters, Boba Fett, who's so cool, et cetera. You, you'll enjoy it. Yeah. All right. Maybe I'll take one more question. Okay. Uh, so, so Henry wrote, uh, uh, Chris, uh, thank you for the valuable education. You're most welcome. Your course on Udemy are, are more valuable than some college and university degrees. Thank you. Uh, question, what is your perspective of investing uh, through Wealth Simple? Yeah, I'm not familiar with, with Wealth Simple. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, but if you want, what you can do is at the start of next next week's webcast, um, you could just tell me a little bit more about it uh, and I can do a real-time due diligence on the company for you. Yeah. And Yanni wrote, uh, thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then, thank you, uh, uh, Elnar uh, uh, from, from Iceland here. Uh, just finished uh, your and Luca's Python AI uh, uh, courses, um, stock analysis, tutorials, very inspirational and presentation and content. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for signing up. I see the trophy there uh, for my, my YouTube channel. Uh, I saw you sign up last night. I appreciate that. Uh, and then lastly, Frank wrote, uh, thank you for your time and wisdom, uh, Chris. Excellent. All right, everybody. God bless you all. Again, join me tomorrow at 11 a.m. Everybody in the call is going to get two free gifts. And one person will win my gold MBA product. If you have additional questions, please ask them uh, next week. Or if you're in my silver MBA program, uh, I will see you in a couple of minutes um, for our weekly one-hour Zoom for silver students. If you're gold or platinum, uh, I'll see you at 11.20 today for our weekly two-hour call.
Thank you, everybody. Uh, God bless you, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks.